Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast of the narrative like lectionary. Wait, sorry. Let me start again. <laughs> Pause. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast of the narrative lectionary. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And today we're talking about Easter. Easter this year is April 9th, 2023. And our Easter text in the narrative lectionary is Matthew 28, 1 through 10 is the appearance of Jesus to the women at the tomb. All right. So uh, I think many congregations uh, go to John 20 on Easter morning, mm-hmm. uh, because that is such a beautiful account with Mary Magdalene and her mistaking Jesus for the gardener. Uh, but this one uh, has its own uh, interesting details. Uh, and uh, yeah, and and uh, think we could uh, dive into it and um, find out more about those. So first of all, uh, we talked a bit before we started recording here, but we have after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. So uh, I asked you before we started recording, who's the other Mary? Yeah, and we don't really know. Mary is a very common name in the ancient world, especially in the Hebrew world, referring to Miriam, the sister of Moses, Mm -hmm. who is a prophetess. Uh, We get in Mark, he refers to her as Mary, the mother of James. The difficulty is that James or Jacob is just as common a name. (laughs) And so what we know is that she's another woman disciple of Jesus, and that she, along with Mary, is concerned with making sure that the funeral rites for Jesus are carried out and goes to the tomb with that intention. And we also have another earthquake. So we had talked in the last episode uh, for Good Friday, you said uh, in the Roman world, earthquakes are um, interpreted as signs of um, displeasing the gods, that the gods are angry in some way. Uh, I'm not, yeah. Yeah. Don't know if that's the case here, but I wonder, uh, in the Old Testament, of course, the earthquake is at least sometimes a sign of God's presence, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, famously in, um, what is it, 1 Kings 19, I think when Elijah goes to Mount Sinai, uh, there's an earthquake, but God is not in the earthquake, right? Mm -hmm. But... uh, that's that's the that's the exception really because before that at mount sinai uh, when the children of israel come to mount sinai uh you know having just departed from egypt the earthquake uh is a sign of god's presence on mount sinai along with of course fire and um you know the pillar of cloud and the pillar of, of fire but uh i wonder if here it's more that um sense of it, right? That the earthquake is uh, a sign of the presence of God or the the action of God here, because the angel of the Lord uh, descends from heaven and rolls back the stone and sits on it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in this case, it's one of those where the gospel texts, like all of our texts of our New Testament, are living in two parallel worlds in the Greco-Roman world and in the Hebrew world. And I think both of those Uh, Thought worlds are operative there, but here especially, uh, Matthew does, says right out, unlike in Mark, where we get something a little bit more mysterious, they see a young man dressed in white. Instead, we have uh, very clearly the angel of the Lord here. As we got right back at the very beginning of Matthew with the appearances to Joseph Mm. and uh, the ways, so we have uh, kind of a and or not end camps, uh, bookends, that's what I'm looking for, to the story here with that angel of the Lord appearing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the angel says, do not be afraid, which is what angels always say, right? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> the, <laughs> fear not, fear not. Mm-hmm. It's the almost always the first words out of an angel's mouth, fear not. Um, uh, and why not be afraid? Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has been raised, as he said, come see the place where he lay. Um, uh, and then uh, immediately upon sharing that astounding news with the women, he tells, he commissions them, go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. Uh, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him. So they leave the tomb 
with fear and great joy. I like that detail, right? It's mm-hmm. not uh, it's not just Easter joy. I mean, that that is the overwhelming sense, I think, uh, on Easter morning, at least, you know, with trumpets and Easter lilies and joy is the operative word, I think, uh, on Easter morning. But on that first Easter, fear is part of it as well, because this is um, a cosmic kind of event, right, as signified by the earthquake. Oh, and it is. And I think the other thing that's important is uh, when we read the passion story, one of the things that we see is that his disciples all abandon him. Mm. We get in Matthew that quotation from Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd and scatter the sheep. So you get that image of sheep who are terrified and just running in all directions from that quotation. And I think we see that they're commanded to go to these disciples who the when last we saw them had abandoned Jesus mm. and to tell them he has been raised. And so there is great joy that Jesus, whom they love, has returned. But also the question of what does it mean for those who did not show faith to him mm. in his hour of deepest need? And so I think that is part of the mixture of emotions that's going on here at the tomb. Mm. We before we started recording too, you talked about this gesture, and honestly, I've I've not um, noticed it before. But when Jesus comes uh, to meet them, he says in verse nine, suddenly Jesus met them and said greetings, and they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, "Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me." Can you tell me more about this taking hold of his feet? What is that about? Yeah, so this is something we see in the Mediterranean world, in the ancient Mediterranean world, that when you make a request of someone, especially if a woman makes a request of a man, they will grab their feet or grab them around the ankles before making the request. The most famous example of this is in Homer's Iliad, when the mother of Achilles goes to Zeus and grabs him around the ankles before she makes makes a request regarding her son. But it's a way of showing both your obedience to a person, this kind of submissive gesture of bowing before them, uh, but it's also a way to show the claim that you have upon them hmm. in that you are holding on to them and you won't let them go until, uh, it reminds me a little bit of Jacob at the Fords of the Jabbok. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Huh. Nice. And so I think we see this a little bit in terms of this is a, a, a making a request, or we call this kind of using a fancy word, we call it supplication uh, in Jesus's response to them, which is do not be afraid that with in regard to their uh, grabbing hold of him, he comforts them. He lets them know that his return is indeed good news, mm. that his return is something of great joy and not just fear. And so I think that's part of what's going on with that gesture there. That's really beautiful. So the, so, it, and I like that contrast you draw, right? Obviously grasping onto someone's feet requires that you're much lower than the right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it is a kind of um, subservient uh, gesture. And at the same time, as you say, and I like your connection with Jacob wrestling with God uh, in, in uh, Genesis 32, it's a, it's a holding on uh, and a, mm-hmm. a kind of laying claim to that's not the right phrase but but having a claim on uh, on this person in authority uh, that that is not completely subservient right it's a it's a uh, having a claim on uh, suppl- asking for um, something there's a there's a relationship there in other words it's yeah. kind of one way street. This shows up also in the story, I don't remember quite the vocabulary in Matthew, but in the story of Jesus and the Canaanite woman, Mm. she comes in and she bows before him, again, with this, probably this idea of she is, she has a request for him that has to do with her daughter. But again, it shows both the, as we said, the request that they're making, but then it's a claim of relationship. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, And so, again, these, the, the women who are have fear and great joy are both showing their joy that they see Jesus again by touching him. And so showing that he is indeed a real person that can be touched. 
uh, but also showing their claim on their relationship with him, that they are asking him to remember that they are his disciples. Yeah, I think uh, our commentator for this week, Ruth Anna Hook, uh, puts it nicely. She talks about that this, this Easter appearance is both cosmic, right, the earthquake and the angel and um, the, you know, rolling away the stone, uh, and also a kind of uh, not everydayness, but an intimacy uh, there as well uh, that you we've been talking about with the the relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, um, and a promise of um, a promise of presence here. Uh, uh, Ruth Anna Hook talks about that as well. Uh, and we'll see that, of course, in uh, next Sunday's reading when we get to the Great Commission. But Jesus' resurrection is not, Jesus' resurrection is a cosmic event, uh, an inauguration of a new age, the breaking in of God's kingdom into this world and the defeat of death, uh, which is, um, you know, the, the great devourer, right? Uh, uh, Jesus becomes the the end of death, the death of death, right? Uh, as I think Martin Luther was uh, said. But so it is cosmic and it and and that's what we celebrate on Easter. And it is also personal uh, mm -hmm. uh, because Jesus appears to the women. And of course, I, I I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, that it is significant that it's women who are the first witnesses of the resurrection. Uh, and the first evangelist, really, uh, to share mm -hmm. this good news. Um, so, so cosmic and personal, um, and it remains the same for us uh, today. I think, as we uh, as we preach once again, uh, the 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 resurrection, the story of the resurrection, to those in our congregation and those we probably haven't seen since Christmas, or maybe since last Easter, right? <laughs> Uh, who who come for the big festivals, uh, but a, a message that in both dimensions is important for us to hear again uh, in the year of our Lord 2023, that, that Jesus' resurrection is a cosmic event and also uh, one that is deeply relational uh, and, um, and important for our own uh, for our own relationship with Christ uh, and uh, and our hope for ourselves and those we love most dearly in the world. In yeah, I think that's a great lens both to look at the resurrection story, but then also to look at the Great Commission that we'll see next week. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. Happy Easter. <laughs>